Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming for my talk. Um, so I believe everyone who's sitting in this room has a mobile phone, a laptop, and you all know, like, when you have access to internet, lots and lots of data is being collected from your machines, sometimes with your consent and sometimes without your consent. And it's really hard to track who's taking your information and what are they doing with it. But would it help to know that there's a way that all these websites will collect your data, will give you amazing recommendations and inferences out of your data, but at the same time will ensure that your data remains private and nobody gets to know your personal information. And that's why I'm here uh, introducing homomorphic encryption that ensures privacy all around us. And the main focus here is going to be how we try to ensure privacy in the open source world using homomorphic encryption. So before we deep dive into this, I would like to take a moment and introduce myself. My name is Akanksha Duggal. I am a senior data scientist from the Emerging Technologies Data Science team at Red Hat at the office of the CTO. I originally come from uh, Boston, United States of America, and uh, I have my GitHub, LinkedIn, Twitter, all linked here. If you have questions or concerns about this topic, happy to chat about that. So let's move towards homomorphic encryption. Uh, I would assume that most of us know what encryption is, but still would like to take a moment to explain what that is. It's basically a way of scrambling the data so that only certain authorized parties would have access to the information of what that data actually means. And what is homomorphic encryption? It's basically the process where we can perform computation on this encrypted data. So as most companies continue to develop machine learning models, sometimes these machine learning models could be a key asset to the company and therefore cannot be directly shared with a client who wants to use this model on their data. And at the same time, this data is also confidential to the client, which they don't want to share with the company who's providing their machine learning and AI services to them. And that's where homomorphic encryption comes in picture. It lets you apply the machine learning from the company and cli uh, client's data on that model without neither of them getting to know about the details of the private information that they have here. Talking about applications of homomorphic encryption, there are tons and tons of them, starting from healthcare to smart electric grids, from education to machine learning as a service. Name it, and homomorphic encryption can be applied to literally any industry where input privacy is the paramount concern. In my opinion, the most important use case of homomorphic encryption would lie in the healthcare industry, where precision medicine would involve a lot of uh, privacy-related rules and regulations, and a lot of the companies who are in the pharmaceutical industry and creating medicines or they need important data to predict what sort of medicines we want to have for certain kind of diseases, it's really, really important to also ensure the privacy and all the data that was concerned with the patient. So that's where homomorphic encryption is super important because if you breach any of the rules and regulations associated to the privacy of the patients, it comes at a huge cost. So homomorphic encryption lets you just bypass that extra cost that you pay usually if you breach these rules and regulations. And it helps you still make good predictions using all the past data that we've collected over the years. And talking about how homomorphic encryption can be really vital in the open source world. As we all know, the benefits of homomorphic encryption is to ensure that there is a private, a secure, collaborative environment, and that's the common part with the open source world, where transparency is the most important thing we would like to ensure when it comes to open source communities and open source projects. And also at the same time, we would like to ensure that there is some sort of privacy and a secure environment for our contributors as well. Starting off with protecting sensitive information, 
So open source communities oftentimes deal with a lot of sensitive information. For example, there is user data, there is passwords, some financial transactions, and we would like to ensure that this data is not open for everybody, even though it's a part of the open source project. And homomorphic encryption ensures that only authorized parties get to see the private information. However, we still try to ensure that this data is put in the right places, encrypted, and only used for the right purposes also helps in uh, secure collaboration. So for example, there are sometimes multiple companies who are collaborating on an open source project, even though they want to put together their technical abilities, technical um, knowledge to this project. However, they do not want their proprietary information to be shared with this competitor company whom they are working with on this project. So open, uh, homomorphic uh, encryption ensures that there is a secure collaboration between two different uh, companies and developers uh, while they contribute to the open source projects. Protecting the intellectual property, as we said that uh, sometimes the models and the data that these companies bring together are an asset to these companies. How much ever they would like to contribute to the open source world, sometimes few things cannot be made public. For example, if you were to do an automated driving system, uh, Tesla is like the only leader in the market at this point, but if other companies were to join hands and put together a machine learning model, put together data sets, but they cannot seem to share the data sets in the whole wide world. So what they can do is just put together their data, encrypt it, whereas all of them use it for the same model, ensuring that all this data that they've collected was private and still making uh, good predictions for the automated driving systems. Finally, ensuring data privacy. It is also very important to ensure that any sort of personal data is protected from getting leaked. Uh, also, a lot of open source projects have secure voting. Um, so oftentimes, you have to vote for some decisions that we would like to take uh, in open source communities. If you want to like go further with this project, do we want to like get, get extra brownie points for this particular project? And sometimes people don't have uh, the entire privacy to cast their vote freely. So homomorphic encryption is something that could be brought into picture and ensure that people have the right to vote and also just the privacy to vote for whichever project they want to vote for. So having said that, um, homomorphic encryption does have a lot of advantages. Uh, starting from performing inferences on encrypted data, just like it would perform inferences on the plain data, there is no interaction that is involved between the data set holder or the model holder. And it also helps to just like do the outsourcing for data storage. But everything comes with some sort of disadvantages. Since this is a computation that is performed on encrypted data, it is computationally very, very expensive. The normal computers are usually not designed for homomorphic encryption kind of workloads. So it comes at a huge cost. And even to do the smallest of the calculations, it takes a lot of resources to just perform addition or subtraction. Besides that, uh, it also has some limitations in terms of the calculations that you can perform on the data. So the major thing when we do as a data scientist in any of our projects is data filtering, data cleaning, data comparison, but homomorphic encryption specifically lacks this use case where you cannot compare two values. It basically cannot let you know which value is lesser than the other value. And that also makes data filtering or data division an impossible task. So anything that involves operations besides division or comparison can be performed using homomorphic encryption. But this is like the only limitation that we have so far. So talking about different types of homomorphic encryption, uh, back in the 80s and 90s when we first started not me, but when the world started to research on uh, homomorphic encryption, the first scheme and uh, the first type of homomorphic encryption was developed. It's called the partial homomorphic encryption. Uh, it was started with the Paleo crypto system. It allows only basic operations where you can perform addition and multiplication. 
Uh, we, this also has couple limitations, which I'll go over in the demo as well. But you can perform two encrypted numbers addition, but you still cannot do multiplication between two encrypted numbers. You can only do one encrypted number and one plain number. So this does has kind of limitations, but if you talk about the era this was developed in, I think they were doing a pretty good job at that time. Then comes the somewhat etchy, which came up with some more uh, advanced abilities. Uh, it supports only two operations, but it has more depth. You can like get into the technicalities. You can perform algebraic equations, and BFP scheme is one of the things that uh, comes under the somewhat etchy. I would not go into too much detail about these schemes because I think that's a good topic for another talk. Uh, but just to give you an overview, uh, somewhat AHE is uh, the majorly the BFE scheme comes as a part of the somewhat HE category. And then comes the fully HE. So as, as of now, uh, most of the researchers and companies are using fully homomorphic encryption techniques to perform homomorphic encryption. It can allow you to perform any number of complex um, operations, any depth, exponentials, matrix multiplication, name it, and you can perform it using fully homomorphic encryption. At this point, even machine learning models like linear uh, regression, logistic regression, uh, CNN models, image detection, all of it is possible only and only because of the fully homomorphic encryption scheme. It uses the approximation of uh, real numbers to uh, make predictions and uh, make calculations on encrypted data. So one small difference between how somewhat HE and fully HE are different from each other. So for example, we had two numbers, two and three, which add up to five. But somewhat HE would approach this problem as encryption of two plus encryption of three is equals to five. Whereas fully HE makes you give an approximate estimate of what this number could be. It does not directly add two and three. It would be somewhere around say 1.99 to uh, 3.99 or it would say 1.99 plus 2.99, some, something which is like plus minus error of 10%. So it would not be an exact calculation, but if you see in long-term and complex calculations, this is actually much more accurate than just assuming them to be real integers. And that would cause some sort of errors if you're doing just like whole numbers at some point. So when it comes to complex mathematical operations, it makes much more sense to have the approximate feature where you can just go to decimal points and perform the calculations. So we also performed a comparison study on various open source tools that are available and we performed some research on that. So Talking about like the kind of work I do at Red Hat, our team is mainly focused on doing research-based projects in mainly Python, where we come up with machine learning and AI solutions for any sort of problems within and outside Red Hat. So um, as a part of that, most of our code is written in Python. So we thought if we have to integrate this feature in any of our projects, it would make much more sense to have this tool written in Python language. Whereas when you just first Google homomorphic encryption, you will see that Microsoft Seal, uh, which is written completely in C++, it is uh, not something that we can directly use for any of our projects. So the first challenge that we want to tackle here was we need libraries, open source libraries that are specifically written in Python and that can be seamlessly integrated with the code base that we already have. So starting with the Paleo crypto system, uh, which is the first uh, technique that was developed as a part of the Paleo crypto system. Uh, it's developed from 1999. It's a partial homomorphic encryption scheme. As I said, uh, it does have limitations of performing operations. We can only do addition and multiplication of one plain text and an encrypted number. So this is kind of, um, a shortcoming for this encryption system that it cannot perform complex operations. But for anybody who's just starting to get into 
crypto system and encrypting numbers and getting into the encryption area, I think Paleo's crypto system is the best way to understand the basics of this concept and to get an understanding of how and why we are doing all of this. Then comes the Pi seal, which is also a wrapper function for uh, the Microsoft seal, but it has a lot of limitations in terms of trying to import this to our Python code. Um, it, it has to be built with certain number of config files, and there are a lot of dependencies that oftentimes are hard to manage when it comes to open source uh, projects where we would want seamless uh, integration with new people, new projects. It's kind of difficult to manage something like this. So we thought that we'll research more about this. And uh, then we found a Pi FHE. It was developed a couple years ago in MIT as a part of a PhD project. Uh, it's a fully homomorphic encryption library written in Python and includes the BFE and the CKKS scheme. Uh, it has almost all the operations that you would like to perform on your data. Uh, but like, as soon as these people graduated out of school, they start maintaining this project. There's lack of documentation. How much ever we would like to use this, it definitely lacks a lot of documentation to be used on a long-term basis. And then we found out PyFHEL, which is also an open source homomorphic encryption library, has tons and tons of uh, operations that are available. It has a very similar syntax to normal arithmetic. It's super easy to use, uh, and it uses C and C++ in the back end. Uh, it's perfect for any sort of homomorphic encryption operations. Uh, but if you all know more about data science, um, most of our data is in the form of vectors. And when it comes to complex operations, we would also like to use vector arrays and things that you can use to perform on tensors. And finally, like we ended almost our research on Tenseal. It is uh, an open source library developed by Open Minded. Uh, it is built on the top of Microsoft Seal. Super easy to use. It's literally a pip install Tenseal and you can just start using it right away in your scripts, in your Jupyter notebooks, super seamless to use. And with the ability to perform these operations on tensors, we can use PyTorch models, uh, we can perform any sort of machine learning operations using Tenseal. So we've also done a proof of concept using Tenseal library. It's super easy to perform logistic regression and make predictions on any data that you have. Uh, so this is uh, the by far the most awesome library that we found. Uh, Open Minded is also currently working on another open source Python library, which is uh, very similar to PySeal. So basically, they're just reviving that old library, which was dead a couple years ago. And they're trying to revive it and also make it a pip install that you can use for uh, any sort of data that you have. But Tenseal is more focused on tensors and vectors and complex machine learning algorithms. So I think I'm going to move to the demo and give you an overview of what we've done so far and uh, how did we get to this research point. Like it looks super easy, like we do like a comparison study, but like it's months and months of effort where we get to understand what we've done so far. And I would like you to also go to the repository and check it out if, you're, if this is something that interests you. You can just go to the repository where we have put together all the documentation and all the pain points that we went through. There's issues, there's documentation that you could go through. Uh, so starting off with all the notebooks that we've put together. So as I said, we started with the Python Paleo. Uh, this is the most basic way of getting into the crypto system industry. Uh, you can just like go through the notebook and try to understand how and why we are doing this. So starting off with, we import this library uh, from Paleo and just assign to random numbers. And then we try to encrypt them and perform addition on that. So once we add them, we get the result, which is exactly the number that we were expecting. And we also try to do the same thing with a scalar and an encrypted number. Again, we got a correct result. But the most important thing to notice here is that how long does it take to perform this computation? I agree this is an accurate 
uh, measurement of what this addition would be, but it takes a lot longer than expected. So if you look at it, the homomorphic addition took 92.8 microseconds, whereas the vector addition, which is the normal uh, addition, it took 102 nanoseconds. So if you were to see the comparison of this, the vector addition is more than 1,000 times faster than homomorphic addition. So this comes at a huge cost of time and resources. But if you talk about doing a multiplication between two numbers using the Paleo library, what you see is they give you an error which says good luck with that because they don't have the ability to multiply two numbers. So this was the first, first set of things that they started to work on in terms of homomorphic encryption and slowly and gradually it improves and that's what I'm going to show. So I'll go over to Tensile, which is like the final library and make a comparative study of how this is better and faster from the Paleo crypto system. So Tensile, as I said, super easy to import, just import Tensile and uh, initialize a context with couple values and parameters that you would like to specify. Uh, Tensile also has great documentation on how you should parameterize your encryption keys, etc. Then we take couple vectors, uh, try to perform addition. So we first perform ciphertext to plain text, which is one scalar and one encrypted value. And we also do the same for subtraction, multiplication, etc. But uh, let's move to the ciphertext to ciphertext calculation and try to track the timing and memory that it takes to do so. So if you look at the addition, uh, homomorphic addition took 24.9 microseconds, whereas vector addition took 1.71 microseconds. The funny thing to notice here is how far we've come. Uh, the last notebook we saw, it was a nanosecond and a microsecond. And now they both at least have the same metric at this point. So earlier it was more than 1000 times faster. At this point, it's just 15 times faster, which is still something that is doable with the amount of resources that are available right now in terms of performing any sort of computations. I think this is still a reasonable amount of resources that homomorphic mm -hmm. encryption requires at this point. Then if you look at subtraction, that is also around 15 times uh, faster and then multiplication, however, takes much, much longer. So vector multiplication is 3000 times faster than homomorphic multiplication. But if you all have done any sort of computations on data and machine learning, you would know that uh, it's no piece of cake. It does not require just addition. It's much more complex than you would imagine. There's derivatives, etc. So it takes much, much more resources when it comes to the real problems. And that's why we performed a proof of concept to see how long and how expensive this is going to be to actually perform homomorphic encryption in the real world. Yeah. So we did a logistic regression proof of concept. We took a data set from Kegel. Uh, this is a heart disease data set, and we wanted to predict um, the overall risk using all the data that was available. So we have this data available here, like we just inspect what the data has. Um, we just try to clean it up a little, remove the uh, NA values, and then drop a couple columns that were looking irrelevant. And just quickly put together a logistic regression model without any encryption on this data. It's just like five lines of code. You mention a classifier and uh, make a prediction and finally calculate the accuracy. And this is the final report that we get after doing basic logistic regression. And mind you, this takes literally a second. So this is Jupyter Notebooks for who uh, don't know what this is. So Jupyter Notebooks is an interactive form of using Python code. Uh, you can just run each cell at your own expense. You can run these cells in any order and you can get an output right away. So when the moment you uh, click enter on these cells, it just takes like a couple seconds to show the result. So that's how fast creating models on uh, small data sets or just non-encrypted data sets is. So now we move forward, we create a torch model, uh, just try to initialize the logistic regression model here, which gave us a good accuracy on this data set. And then finally, we thought it would be interesting to do an evaluation on 
a model and the data that is encrypted and see how long does it actually take. So when we perform encrypted evaluation uh, on this data set, let me just quickly go to the final part. So we try to do a couple epochs. Uh, when I was doing it on my system, initially I just like tried five epochs because that's something that I just choose as a number to start my calculation with. And my Jupyter Hub, it just hung up on me because this was eating up so many resources. Then I brought it down to some less number of epochs. So I, th I went with three and I thought that was a sweet spot where it wasn't breaking for me. The average time for each epoch to train here took 350 seconds, whereas the normal logistic regression would take barely a second to just run. And here it took 350 into four. That's super long uh, for doing any sort of basic calculation on a very small data set. So this data set has only 4,000 rows, uh, and still it takes this long to make uh, a prediction on this data set. But if we talk about the accuracy, uh, it was much better than the normal one that we got on the basic logistic regression model. Might be a flake, but uh, I would like to believe that it took its sweet time, used the encrypted data, but still came up to the level of the plain uh, logistic regression model, which is awesome. So one thing we are sure of here that if anything, this is an accurate model that makes accurate predictions just comes with some shortcomings that it's sometimes expensive for you. But we are also working with a couple teams within and outside Red Hat to ensure that we can have some sort of accelerators and distribute our workloads so as to ensure that it is not as computationally expensive as it's getting. Uh, so hopefully, uh, maybe next time we would have like a much more optimized uh, proof of concept where we are doing all of the same things but in a much faster and less expensive fashion. So that's about my demo. I will go back to the slides. Uh, I don't think we have the time, but I think, uh, do we have time? Yes, we still have like uh, seven minutes. Or yeah. yeah, I can quickly go over uh, the most frequently asked questions. Uh, so a lot of people ask how is homomorphic encryption related to federated learning. Uh, these two go hand in hand, and a lot of people oftentimes confuse one for the other. Even though both of them ensure security, privacy, ensuring distributed workloads, collaborative environment, they are specifically different from each other. So homomorphic encryption is basically, I have the model and you send your encrypted data to me. Whereas federated learning is just training machine learning models on decentralized devices. Basically means that there is a model somewhere and I encrypt the model and send it to the people who have their data that they cannot share. So for example, if there's a pharmaceutical company who has like sensitive patient's data and they would want to use my model and they'll tell me that, oh, I have like huge data sets, I can't possibly encrypt that and send it to you. So what I do as a data scientist is that I encrypt my model and send it to them and they can just use it at their own expense and try to make predictions on their data. But coming back to the initial statement that I made when I started my talk was that lots and lots of websites are collecting data and I don't want them to see my data. I don't want them to just like openly use my data to make predictions. Homomorphic encryptions ensures the privacy of the data uh, while making predictions, but federated learning is something that that company would still have access to your data. The model, which is a proprietary information to a different company, that is the encrypted part here. So I still think when it comes to the privacy of ensuring contributors' data or customers' data, homomorphic encryption is the way to go. But federated learning is no bad. Uh, I think it still ensures that your data lies within the company and doesn't go out in the open world. So that's the comparative study between homomorphic encryption and federated learning. And 
Another more frequently asked question is how is it related to confidential computing? So confidential computing uh, involves a lot of hardware and uh, you need to ensure that you put your data in a private spot. So for example, Amazon, Microsoft, all of these big players are putting up storage centers where they ensure the privacy of your data by putting them in a remote location. Uh, which is also, again, very expensive. Not only does it require storage space, it actually requires a physical space to store all of this data somewhere in a private environment. So that's like the main differences between homomorphic encryption and confidential computing. There are a couple blogs out there that you can check out to understand the differences between the two. Uh, this is just like my study on how these two are different from one and the other. So that's it from my side. Um, this is the GitHub repository and my email with my colleague who's worked on this project. Please feel free to ask any questions or uh, concerns. Feel free to raise issues on the repository if you're interested to contribute, and I would be happy to help you out with that. There's a question. Yeah, feel free. Yeah, so all the tools that I mentioned uh, in the presentation were based in Python. Well, in real life, when we want to care about a big amount of data and uh, don't want to reveal them, it means uh, that uh, we uh, should store uh, the data in some database. So if uh, we can process uh, this data only uh, with uh, Python tools, it means that uh, should be done somewhere between uh, database and Python tools, which uh, looks suboptimal. It uh, would be better to, uh, to store this uh, encrypted, encrypted data in database uh, and uh, provide a, a result uh, and compilation in the database itself. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that uh, script languages uh, are uh, the best tool if we dealing with uh, real data security. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Yeah. I'm going to repeat the question. Uh, so he asked that uh, since we, we put all our data in the database, uh, it's oftentimes, uh, you know, like it involves a lot of operations to encrypt the data. Shouldn't we do it before putting it somewhere so nobody has access to the exact information? Is that right? Uh, sort of. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, all right. That's a very good question. Uh, so as a part of this project, we have just done a proof of concept. And the whole point why we use Jupyter Notebooks is to just see the results the moment we perform any sort of calculation. Uh, but if we were to talk about the real world where real data exists, we would try to create a pipeline of this data. So the moment the data is being collected from our customers, it should be in the pipeline where a script runs on this data and ensures that before it reaches the database, it should be encrypted. And once it's in your database, it's, it's already going to be encrypted before that step. And from this database, you can choose any sort of calculation on or algorithm that you want to perform on this data, ensuring that the data was still private. So I think it's, this is all customizable. I just threw everything together in one notebook. It's super easy to put them in different scripts and in different order of the pipeline that you would like to perform this operation on. Yes. So uh, you showed the toolkit, the Python toolkits. Mm -hmm. uh, and for following on the market, they were supporting uh, CDDS. Uh, yeah, CKKS. Do any of them support uh, BGD? Yeah, so fully homomorphic encryption has CKKS and BGB schemes both. Okay, and, and those libraries, uh, uh, you, you add on the slide. Yeah, when I say like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So most of the libraries that uh, support CKKS also support the BGV scheme. Okay. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Go for it. Okay. And ask, um, so this is about like simple linear regression, regression, right? Yeah. So I might assume that the same performance it would be when you would try anything else. I mean, that's a reasonable assumption. Mm -hmm. 
began essentially they were to try to confidentially write something like you know actually industry grade you know let's say mm -hmm. standard image recognition you know let's yeah. say exception in that, mm -hmm. okay retrain it on something fairly simple mm -hmm. that would on any reasonable hardware if i'm right take several years probably <laughs> Because like since this is like two orders of magnitude hit, yeah. I mean, if if ever ever this became industry standard, then it would essentially push everybody out of the machine learning market, except for like two companies, <laughs> because nobody else could afford it, right? Because yeah. doing this confidentially essentially mm -hmm. means either not doing it at all or having the state's mm -hmm. level budget. That's a great question, and this is the fear that a lot of companies, like even us, thought would be a, a really big uh, con for us in terms of homomorphic encryption. It's super hard to do extensive calculations, but trust me, there's a lot of research going out in the entire world where people are working towards this. Uh, Personally, my team is currently working with the Boston University where we are trying to come up with some sort of FPGA that helps us accelerate, distribute our workloads along with some not so very expensive hardware that would still allow us to do the same sort of operations but at a lower cost and a much faster uh, process. Besides that, there's also different ways where we could write our code in a way, uh, probably like just distribute our code in a way that it's easier to perform calculations so that it doesn't eat up a lot of resources because the biggest resource it's eating up right now is the memory where it creates the keys then encrypts the data stores it somewhere uh, that just eats up a lot of memory but if we have a very distributed uh, way of performing all of this meticulously i think with time uh, it, it the day is not far where we would be able to do all of this seamlessly and about the image detection, uh, there's a lot of research going on MNIST data set, if you're aware of that, where there are numbers, uh, one to nine, zero to nine, and uh, there are pictures of these numbers where the machine learning model tries to recognize the number just by looking at the picture of it. Uh, so there's CNN model, which a lot of people have been exploring on Kaggle using homomorphic encryption as well. There's a lot of open research going on that. Uh, and it's somewhat accurate at this point, just that like since this is an image, it takes longer, you know, even in normal machine learning, the image detection is much harder than numbers. Yeah, and we, uh, but that and this data set, that's very old, that's like the standard, the first thing you do when yeah. you try to do any machine learning, and it's like five seconds to do yep. something with it that you don't encrypt it, so yeah. it takes like five minutes, then I mean, you know, like, that's incredible disadvantage for anybody. Of course. Exactly. But we do have to give the benefit of doubt to homomorphic yeah. encryption because like in 1999 was the first time where there was an actual homomorphic encryption system that was developed and um, we've come so far and since we are starting with logistic regression and CNN models, I think it's only the beginning of this era for homomorphic encryption. And in no time, uh, probably in a couple of years, this is the chat GPT era. We never know when we just reach that point where we are able to do all of this seamlessly soon. Okay, we are at the end of our session. So big thanks to Akansha.